welcome. Um, I'm not mic'd, but I'm American, so I don't think I need one. Um, welcome to Stop, Collaborate, and Listen. For those of you who did get the Vanilla Ice reference, thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm just, as, as many of you, I hope, in the room know, uh, we did a survey to sort of test ideas around innovation and archaeology. So I'm going to introduce the session by doing a bit of a whistle stop through the results that we got um, from that survey. Um, but before I do that, I'm just going to do a bit of housekeeping, which is to, again, say this is a whistle stop, but all of the um, detail from the survey is going to be released online in very exhaustive detail, so you will all be able to see it and slice it and dice it in, in, in any way which sort of takes your fancy. We certainly feel like there's a lot more work to be done and uh, we look forward to, to, to digging into the results a bit more, but I wanted to keep everybody in the room and I knew that if I gave all that information beforehand, you'd all be on your phones looking at it and stuff and completely ignoring all the magic. So um, there's that and also um, Manda is going to be leading the discussion parts of this session um, in a pretty organized way. What we want to avoid um, there are big issues to talk about, and we want to avoid the ranting. We don't want to be playing any burn it all down, bingo. You know, we can all do that later in the pub uh, as per usual. And, um, and yeah, so we're just looking forward to hearing uh, a follow-on from what you all have shared with us on, on the survey. So um, I guess, first of all, you know, why did we do it? Why did we, we bother to do this survey testing um, perceptions of innovation in archaeology? Uh, you know, we were talking about this this morning. Why, why does Dig Ventures do anything? You know, because it just feels like it's there to be done and it might be a good crack. And um, also, we've been experiencing since we started in 2012 these pinch points in our work. And um, it's not necessarily always from inside the sector. It could be from outside the sector. And we thought, let's just really test that and try to unpack where we keep hitting these brick walls or where we feel as archaeologists that what's going on with us is so unique that we can't possibly reach these solutions that are working in the outside world. So we thought, right, let's dig into it and see what's, what's actually going on. So who answered the survey? Well, um, we had a really representative sample. We were happy about that. About 5% of the people from uh, archaeology in, in the UK answered the survey. Um, and a few internationally, which was really good to sort of look at how that's different from the way that uh, British archaeologists answered. And um, we thought that it would also be useful to look at how that compares to um, the sort of breakdown of how people self-identify from the last profile in the profession report. So it's roughly similar. A really high proportion of field archaeologists, advisors, and university. Um, and equally, just thought we'd take a quick look at um, the percentage of people who were members of CEFA. That's a really good number. I'm sure Pete will be happy if he's sitting in the room. Um, and equally, um, we had the same sort of breakdown from the, the levels within CIFA as, as is represented by the overall membership itself. So that's who we're talking about in terms of the respondents to the survey. Right. What is innovation? Well, um, we had some really funny open text answers to this. Some people spent so much time, it was like staring at yourself in the mirror for too long. They started to question what, what was innovation and, and what is the meaning of life itself. Um, <laughs> But uh, we seem to have a pretty good idea about uh, what is innovation, and thankfully it is quite a positive view. Um, although some, uh, one of the other really funny answers was that innovation was something invented by Dig Ventures to basically plague county archaeologists and uh, to hide the fact that we can't actually properly dig a bloody hole. Well, there you go. If you're in the room, let's talk. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I just thought the spread of things, you know, there were obviously more answers than this, but these were the categories that things really broke down to. And I think, too, the most interesting thing is the equality between so it, thinking that it's something that happens inside the sector and something that happens outside, that we adopt from outside the sector. So we'll look at those things in a little bit more detail later. Um, and again, the most popular answers, new ways of working, new ways of thinking, and thank God a really high number on uh, helps us do our jobs better for my sanity. If I hadn't seen that, I'd be really worried. Um, and so I don't see where it fits. So hopefully, you know, this is a snapshot of how we all feel about innovation now, but who knows, maybe some of these I don't see where it fits. People might have a different opinion of it by the end of, um, by the end of today, or who knows, keep, we'll keep trying. But at least we can start the afternoon with uh, an agreement that in archaeology, most of us think that innovation is a good thing, whether or not we understand it. <laughs> And this is why we think it's a good thing. Efficiency, relevance, improving what we do, knowledge, and communicating. I mean, these are really the, the big, big questions that we're asking ourselves as a sector. So um, I was really happy to see that reflected in the data. And you know, we'll be hearing um, 
we'll be hearing from Jeff about what this looks like from outside the sector in just a minute. So I won't say too much, but um, I was really happy to see all of that. And my main takeaway from this bit of the survey um, was that you know we, we do, most of us think that uh, innovation helps us do our, our, our jobs better, but there are barriers. And you know, looking at those barriers um, after we hear from Jeff, um, I think is re really gonna be useful. So what are the barriers? Um, no surprises there. Lack of resources, current structures, and resistance to change. Although there were more specifics when, within a lot of this, you know, this, this is how things are really breaking down for us. And in fact, what I was really struck by is that it seems to be the only thing we can agree on in archeology span is what's wrong. <laughs> we all know what's wrong, we've been talking about it for 30 years, and that was definitely um, reflected in the, in the results from the survey. When where are we failing, sort of same thing. A few big areas, um, and, and you know, implementation was, was interesting, especially um, in light of the quote that I had up, which will be familiar obviously to Jeff, is from something that he wrote before. Maybe, maybe innovation itself is too big a word for us. You know, maybe shooting straight at innovation is what's confusing us. When we think about it being adoption and implementation from things that are working elsewhere, maybe when we break it down into words like that, it'll be easier for us. And that's why I thought that seeing implementation um, coming through in the survey is something um, that we thought was failing was really interesting. So, you know, again, this 50-50 split between innovation being something that we do internally coming from our culture or external basically being a market force on us, um, very interesting for us. And I'm really hoping that in Doug and Gavin's talk, we'll look at how, what the market is doing to us and then what it's like to be a practitioner within that. We'll, we'll shed a little, a little bit more light. Um, I'm also interested in, in this question of, you know, the lack of financial health in the sector was also quoted again and again and again and again as one of the big things that's in our way and why we can't innovate. But why do we think it's so expensive? You know, what is it about being innovative that costs money? And, and what is the real cost of doing that versus what is the cost of not doing that? You know, so looking at the actual genuine steps of what is involved in innovation, I think will be really useful part of this afternoon. And you know, one of Amanda's provocations is, is the answer a shift in our culture and a, a sea change within? Um, and we'll talk about what we think that might look like. Right, so despite the doom and gloom of sort of that area of, of the discussion, um, we, uh, the results from the survey have said that we do see places in the sector where innovation can work and where innovation is working. And um, I think that there, the results indicated that a lot of people are really focused on tech, um, and we see that reflected in the answers. Um, and you know, I have absolutely no um, disagreement with that. But equally, um, there's a huge um, bit of the responses here. We're saying we're doing really well at public access and presentation. And I thought that was interesting because we were just listening to some sessions yesterday where. You know, people coming from the commercial sector are saying that's the worst bit of what we do. We can't communicate, we don't communicate, we're not doing that well. Um, so again, you know, there's, there seems to be a, a sort of identity crisis or a lack of agreement amongst us all about that. Um, and we will be hearing from Victoria and Brendan in the next part of the session about specific case studies of innovation. Uh, Victoria will be talking about it from an organizational perspective. You know, how do you be how, how do you become an organization that is leading on innovation? And what does that look like as it trickles down through your organization and how you interact with the world? And Brendan will be looking at business models um, that might actually open up and create a little bit of room for that to actually happen. Yeah, and actually this is another really good question. We seem to be really, really focused on pay and conditions. And when we get to the, the graph that talks about really what are our issues, obviously that's number one. But would we really be more open to change if there was more money around? Would this influx of cash really fix the issues that we've got in not reaching success, what success might look like in paying conditions? I don't think so. But you know, it seems to, it seems to be the thing that most people identify as being our biggest issue. Let's take a look. Where do we need it? I thought this was really interesting. Um, where we're doing well in remote sensing and survey, it's not where we need it. Where we need it is training, clearly in training. It's almost equal across the, you know, the rest of the, the choices there. 
And these are the areas where we've identified things not going so well. So what would it really look like if we were doing better at those things? Is that something that we should be, wait, may, should be waiting for organizations to take the lead on? Or is that our responsibility as individuals within those organizations or sole traders or whatever? Where are we looking to make those advances? Who are we waiting to help us with it? And then leading into the final section, um, what big innovation are you waiting for? Somebody answered a hoverboard uh, wheelbarrow. And I have not been able to stop thinking about that because how great would that be? Like seriously, for those of us who do field work, how great would that be? Um, but the sci-fi thing, you know, I thought it was really interesting that we did get as many answers in there about, you know, crazy stuff like that because, you know, technology does help us do our jobs better. It is the difference between what is a sustaining innovation and what is a disruptive innovation. Innovation isn't always about breaking stuff and moving fast. Sometimes it's about just making sure that we have things from the outside world that are working for other people that will help us to do our jobs better. Um, and, you know, I'm look, I'm, I still can't stop thinking about that hover thing. Um, so <laughs> I, what I thought was really interesting about the next slide is who is responsible for innovation and who pays for it. If I hadn't seen, if we hadn't seen such a high proportion of individual archaeologists come up in the answer here, I would again be really worried because that would feel that we're all disenfranchised from thinking that we are actually a part, a really necessary part of this process. Um, I'd like to break this down, I think, in future when we're looking at it into who is responsible for innovation and who's paying for it because I don't think they necessarily belong together, but that was how we had asked the question. Um, and here comes our biggest challenges. Paying conditions, you know, far and away the biggest challenge. Um, but what I thought was really interesting when I was looking at that is that demonstrating social value was, was the second one. And then following that, um, and following that we had communi communicating, communication, sorry, communication and leadership consistently in sort of number two spots. So paying conditions, demonstrating social value, communication and leadership. So demonstrating social value, where, is, where does that belong in commercial archaeology? And I'm, this isn't about bashing commercial, it's just saying where in the model is that, is that living? Because again, when we were listening to some of the talks yesterday and having direct conversations with some of the people who work in commercial, that is the biggest challenge. And certainly that's where the most money is being spent in, in what we do. So how are we going to fix that? If that's what's important to us as individual archaeologists, and that's what we think should be inherent in all of the work that we do, but yet we're behind hoardings or we have client confidentiality to worry about, we're, what this is basically saying to me is that we're prevented from doing something that we feel is the most important bit about our work. And the other thing that really struck me about this slide is that evaluating our work is seen to be so unimportant. You know, it's almost nowhere in the answers here. So if communicating our work is so important, but we're not evaluating it, and we don't really have a deep understanding of what we're doing, how are we supposed to really get the message across about why what we do is so important, you know? How are we supposed to argue for our place in the planning frameworks? How are we supposed to argue for the money that we might need to actually start doing more relevant work to the public? Why is it that we keep seeing teleprograms that portray what we do in such a ridiculous light? And I think it's because we're, we're not self-critical enough. We're not doing the kind of evaluation that we should be doing. And again, this is something that is happening out in the real world, and we'll hear more from Jeff, I'm sure, about what that looks like. There are really, really good ways to talk about what we do, and we're just ignoring them. And that, why? Because we don't think it's important. So, what can we do to make a change? And the final section of the, talk, of the session today, we'll be hearing from, um, from Mark about personal leadership. And I think that um, this slide is a really, really great example of you know, all of these people thinking, yes, there definitely is something that I can do to make a change, and I'm going to prioritize it. But what really worries me is the, the people who work in organizations that aren't interested, or the people who think that they're going to have resistance. Um, we want to be really focused within this session by the end of it to, to all agreeing to one thing that we can all do when we leave this room in our own professional practice to help stimulate innovation. It might be something as simple as saying to your manager, I need help, and then demanding it somehow through the structures of your company, or, or even moving laterally and making sure that your coworkers are supported if they're being asked to do something that they don't know how to do, or looking down at people who are not receiving the training that they need to, to progress in their careers or to do a better job. You know, there, there are examples of all of that that each one of us can do that's gonna help inch our sector forward and move the needle a little bit um, on innovation. So are we all waiting for someone else to be innovative or are we, are we willing to make the changes that we want to see? 
do we feel empowered to change or not listen to and frustrated? What can we actually do ourselves? This is how I want to close out and make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of that stuff. And then finally, we're going to hear our next speaker is Jeff Mulgan, um, who's going to present to us a view of archaeology from outside the sector. For those of you who don't know Jeff or Nesta, um, they're really cool. He is not an archaeologist, so be gentle. Um, <laughs> the Nesta does a lot, a lot of work around innovation. They work a lot with uh, social value. They are, they're producing guidance and tons and tons of really useful documents that I think we as archaeologists could learn about in terms of making advances in different areas of our work. Um, we did find out in, in earlier chats with Jeff that uh, he's a secret archaeology fan. So, um, and he had some really, really interesting observations about our work um, that I hope that you will all find valuable. So, that's all. Thank you.